Okay, so let's talk a little bit about insulin resistance. So are you the type of person that gets hangry? Do you uh, need um, to eat every three hours? If you don't eat, do you start getting the shakes and you get the headaches? Do you get fatigued? Do you get sugar cravings? Do you have an inability to lose weight? Do you have migrating aches and pains? Are you getting that bowling ball look in your belly? Are you getting that upper belly fat? Yesterday I, I saw a patient and she said, everybody thinks I'm pregnant and I'm not. She's, she's just shocked because this is, this is a, a woman, she's a great looking woman, very successful professionally. She's in her early 40s and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just grew like you know, a beer belly. Um, and she's very embarrassed by it. Like she won't even date anymore. She, she tries to avoid social engagements. She purposefully wears really, you know, really loose fitting clothes. And she's like, you're the first person I've ever showed my belly to because one thing I want to do is I want to see what the texture is of your fat because that helps me understand what's causing it. And she had insulin resistance. Sure enough, we ran her labs. I had her bring in her labs and we've ran some other labs, but the lab she brought in, her A1C was off. Her blood glucose was off. She had, she'd never had her doctor really talk to her about this because her A1C levels were in the normal parameters. And we're going to talk about this in a minute, but sometimes the way that we're looking at labs are not accurate, but she definitely had insulin resistance. Now what it caused is she was on cholesterol medication now because when you're insulin resistance, that can cause PCOS. Insulin resistance can also cause you to have acne. It can cause hormonal issues and it's one of the major causes, thyroid issues, and insulin resistance, those are the major causes of high cholesterol. And so let's talk about cholesterol for a minute. Now, I, I hope you don't mind, but I wanna share with you a story about, about my dad. Um, my dad's an amazing man. Um, he's got, I grew up in a big family, there's five kids, and he's got lots of grandkids, but my dad almost died of a heart attack. And this was while my dad's, he's watering the track at my, my brother's motorcycle race. And my dad was literally 10 feet from, from dying. There's, luckily there's an ambulance, there's paramedics at motocross races. And, and all of a sudden my dad gets this pain down the left arm and he feels a shortness of breath. So he goes over and, and talks to the paramedic. Sure enough, he's having a heart attack. So he gets to the hospital and they have to crack open his chest. And, He's got four arteries that are 100% occluded. Now, you know, they saved my dad's life, which I'm so grateful for. But my dad had a heart attack literally a week after he got all his blood work done and everything looked normal. So when my dad left the hospital uh, about six months later, he said, you know, now they got me on medication. They got me on cholesterol medication. I'm on a blood thinner, you know, which is okay. I'm on, I'm on two hypertensive meds. I'm on a beta blocker. I'm also on a diuretic, but his energy just wasn't coming back. And so I said, well, wasn't your blood work normal? I mean, wasn't everything good? And he said, yeah, but that's just, that's the standard routine. So once my dad got his medications changed, got off the majority of them, suddenly his energy came back. He's able to, you know, mountain bike. He's a lot more active. This was 14 years ago. This was when I was uh, studying in Hawaii, but um, he's now got his life back, but they put him on these medications because the, and I'm not faulting the doctors, they saved his life, but then when it comes to prevention and keeping a heart attack from coming up again, the only solution they gave him is, all right, we want you to exercise more and here's some drugs and we're gonna be following up on you. We're gonna be checking things out. But, but what we found with cholesterol is maybe cholesterol, after all, is not preventing heart disease because half of the people who have heart attacks have normal levels of cholesterol. The other half have high cholesterol. And what we found is, actually, with pharmaceutical companies, some of the misinformation is they can be very misleading in how they're marketing. So you can see this ad here, and what it says is 36% of heart attacks are prevented by people taking Lipitor. Now what's Lipitor? It's a statin drug. Now if you look at that small print there, it says 
Yeah, this is for the lawyers. If you're a lawyer, this is for you guys. But it says this means in a large clinical study, that means 2% of patients taking the placebo, a large clinical study, or 2% taking Lipitor, had a heart attack. 3% in the control group had a heart attack. So they're, they're looking at that in a large clinical study. So that means 1,800 people in the placebo group and 1,800 people in the Lipitor group. So in the placebo group, 3% out of 1,800 had a heart attack. In the group of individuals taking Lipitor, 2% had a heart attack. So what's the relative value difference between 2 and 3%? That's 36%. And so that's why they're marketing it as, hey, look at this drug, it's going to save your life. But what we found, if you look at the research, 1995, there's no evidence linking high cholesterol levels in women with heart disease. If you look at the American Journal of Cardiology in 2003, they found that despite taking statins, there's no difference in calcified plaque buildup. If you even go and move forward to 2010, if you look at that study, they took 33,000 people and they said medications did not reduce heart disease. Despite lowering blood pressure, lowering blood sugar, lowering cholesterol, nor a combination of these factors. And they said, in fact, we even found an increase in the incidence of heart disease and heart attacks. So maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. Maybe statins are great for some things, but we're, we're finding out that it's, it's just, it's really good at lowering numbers on a lab. So when we look at your body, the secret number four when it comes to get healthier, you can't just look at a number and expect just because your numbers are normal does not mean you're healthy because statins are great at lowering cholesterol, but it's not getting to the cause. In fact, it may be doing more harm than good because some of the side effects are depletion of CoQ10, reduction in sex hormones. It's going to negatively affect your memory. It's going to interfere with serotonin reception or receptors, and it may increase your risk of diabetes and cancer. So this is one reason the World Health Organization, they said 90% of all diseases prevalent today are not treatable with orthodox medical procedures. So we have to ask ourselves, what got us here we, and how can we get out of it? What is the cause of chronic disease? What's the cause of all this weight gain? We've talked about a few things. We talked about stress. We, we've talked a little bit about hormones. Now I want to talk to you about digestive health because what we found that more than anything is if you want to have a healthy digestive system, you've got to look at what could be causing more inflammation in your body. So you have to look at the foods you're putting into it. You also have to look at the diversity in your microbiome because in our digestive systems, in our large intestines specifically, we have a hundred trillion organisms. Now these organisms, the more diverse they are, the better. So you want lots of different families, they're all competing against each other, so things stay pretty balanced. But what happens is our bodies, if, it gets, if we get too much inflammation, the tight junctures in our intestinal wall start leaking out food particles. And those food particles start causing this inflammatory reaction and an autoimmune disease develops because we have 70% of our immune system resides outside of our intestinal wall. So if you have food that's leaking through, that can cause an overgrowth of yeast. It can cause an overgrowth of bacteria. You can get parasites that build up. And then that nice, healthy, diverse culture becomes disrupted. And so you start having certain bacterial strains that overgrow, and that's called a bacterial infection. And that can rage on and on, and it can cause joint pain, it can cause headaches, it can make you feel really fatigued, it can make you feel kind of sick all the time, like you've got this low-grade fever. And it can make you put on weight like crazy. So I want to talk to you about a study where they, they, they did this study, they've done it at 15 major universities. The first study came out five years ago. And what they found, this was at University of Columbia, they took mice who were overweight. So they took fat mice and they, they had a group of mice that were healthy, healthy mice, skinny mice, they were, they were fit. And what they did is they did a fecal transplant. So they took the stool from the fat mice and they put that, that stool into the skinny mice. 
Likewise, they took the stool from the skinny mice and they transported it and put the fecal matter into the fat mice. And interestingly enough, they didn't change the diet, by the way. Interestingly enough, what they found is that the fat, fat mice became skinny and the skinny mice became fat, even though they're eating the same foods. And so they started digging in and they said, well, maybe bacteria has something to do with obesity, with weight gain. And they looked at it and they found that there's, there's a specific culture in your gut, a specific family of bacteria called Formiculites. And what Formiculites does is it, it, its sole job is to store food for energy in fat cells so that it can survive. Because remember, your bacteria are dependent for their survival on you, just like you're dependent on them. And so they found with these fecal matter transplants that there's got to be a link between having intestinal permeability issues when you've got food leaking out and inflammation with proper growth of bacteria and yeast and all the other organisms in your gut. And they, they found that if we can get that balanced, then that's one of the ways that we can help you get healthy. We can turn off autoimmune disease that way. And that's how we can also get you, your body to lose weight, to get rid of that symptom. We're not going to do a fecal transplant on you. Don't worry. But um, we are going to have to look through stool analysis as far as how your gut's performing. One of the other tests that we want to do when you come in is we want to look at, if, if you come in or you can do it, you can just call our office, but one of the other things we want to look at, what foods are causing the issues? So we found that there are some major foods that are pro-inflammatory. One of the major foods is gluten. And you may say, oh, it's a gluten trend, but we found that about 80% of you are going to have an immune reaction to gluten. Dairy, there's a protein in dairy called casein. We're going to test you for that. We're going to see if you react to corn. We're going to look at eggs, and then we're going to look at peanuts. Then we're going to look at, you know, we like to look at 300 different foods so we can really isolate what foods your body needs, what nutritional impact is going, is going to have on you, so we can give you things to replace those foods that you removed. So the biggest thing when you're looking at health is, like I mentioned before, we don't want you to focus on numbers on a lab because what happens is, a lot of us, we still feel like crap, even though our labs are normal, especially with thyroid cases. We see that all the time. So lab ranges, unfortunately, are inaccurate in most cases. So when you bring your labs in, what we're going to do is we're going to narrow the parameters. So bring it in if you've had them within the last six months. If it hasn't, if it's been before that, it might be helpful, but we're probably going to want to get some of those ran again. But most labs, they use bell curves and they take 95% of the population from that lab and they say, okay, as long as you fit within this parameter that 95% of people are falling into, that means your lab is normal. But what we found with functional labs and functional medicine, we want to narrow the parameter. So I'll give you an example. This is TSH. Now TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. Now 0.3 to 5.7, that's the typical ranges. Where we want to keep you is between 1.8 and 3.0. Those are functional lab ranges. What that means is we're not going to let your body get all the way off the tracks before we actually start doing something when it comes to your health. So we want to make sure that we've got those lab ranges right around 2.0 to 2.4 is kind of the sweet spot. The other thing we're going to look at is we're going to see how's your testosterone. Now these values are related to men. Women, if your testosterone gets this high, you're going to grow a beard. Your voice will become low. You'll get male pattern baldness. Um, otherwise, it's safe. <laughs> well, I don't know if it is, but it's not safe. Don't get your testosterone this high, ladies. Men, speaking to you right here, I want your testosterone levels to be right around like, you know, 650 to 800. You're going to feel better in this range. You're going to be more vital. You'll feel like um, a Spartan. You'll, you'll be able to you know, have the energy you need. You'll burn fat. The, the cortisol level that you can see here, one of the most important tests that we're going to run on you is we have to look at how your adrenals are functioning. So we want to make sure that your adrenals follow this, this circadian rhythm. So your cortisol levels are going to be higher in the morning, which is good. That helps you wake up and it helps you, you know, confront the day, get your workout in. And then it's going to start slowly fading down as the day goes on. That's, that's a normal cortisol cycle. 
where, where we find the most issues is a lot of us, our cortisol levels spike at night when we're supposed to be sleeping. Then you're laying in bed just you know, awake. And then in the day when your cortisol should be up in the morning, that's when it drops. And so you have a hard time getting out of bed. You fall asleep at five in the morning, you can't wake up till noon. So it starts affecting your work. It starts affecting your relationships because you're so tired, you don't feel like doing anything in the day. So when you're looking at this, we have to get an overall picture from testing. So we find that if you have the proper testing, you can avoid diseases like hypothyroidism. You can avoid prediabetes or diabetes. You can, you can keep your adrenal stress normal. You can balance your hormones that way. Even testing for foods, you can have a better idea of what you should be eating. So food sensitivities, gastrointestinal disorders can be prevented and reversed when you've got the right tests. I mean, we just had a patient who came in, he had a second colonoscopy after working with us for six months, and his GI doctor said, I've never seen this, I don't know what you've been doing, but you have no more diverticulitis. You, are, you have a clean bill of health. Brain malfunctions, we have to look at your brain, we have to see how it functions. And then autoimmune conditions. Now, autoimmune disorders, a lot of people, what they don't realize is if you've got one autoimmune disorder, your chances of having another autoimmune disease are tripled. So that's, that's pretty startling. And we find that 90% of women who have Graves disease, which is a, an autoimmune disease of the thyroid, when you, you're anxious, your heart palpitates, um, you're restless, you, your hair will fall out, that's when your, your thyroid is overperforming or Hashimoto's, which is when it's underperforming. But 90% of thyroid issues in women is due to Hashimoto's. Now, how are we treating thyroid issues? Unfortunately, we're treating it with Synthroid. Synthroid is T4, and it's not addressing the immune system. So a lot of the thyroid issues that we see in our country and in, in America right now are due to autoimmune disease. So what that means is we're not treating the right thing. We're treating the thyroid when we really should be treating the immune system, which stems right in your digestive tract. So the best way to do that is treat the right thing because 50 to 60% of patients who have Hashimoto's or Graves have other organs being attacked. Like in diabetes, that's when your pancreas is being attacked by your immune system. Multiple sclerosis. That's where the, the myelin sheath around the nerves are being attacked by your, your body's own immune system. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Crohn's, IBS, rheumatoid arthritis, these are all autoimmune diseases. But we treat the symptoms and we treat the name, we treat that box that they put you in, you have osteoporosis, here's the medication. And it's not getting us where we need to go. So one of the best things that we want to do is we want to get the right test ordered so that we're not blindfolded when it comes to your health. So here's a couple of patients of ours who've had phenomenal results just by following some of the protocols that we've given them. We've dug in, we find the real cause, we've looked at food sensitivities, we've ordered the correct test, and they've had phenomenal results.